Hello and welcome to Press TV's news analysis. I'm Kavit Afwai. Saudi Crown Prince Sultan bin Abdul Aziz has died. His death setting in motion succession plans. Saudi Arabia's Interior Minister Prince Nayef is set to be the first in line to become the Crown Prince, but he would have to be confirmed in that position by the Allegiance Council. Well, in this edition of the News Analysis, we will examine whether this death could signify the beginning of a power struggle within the Saudi Kingdom. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince and heir to the throne died in a New York hospital on Saturday. The death of Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz Al Saud has left the key U.S. ally in a power vacuum, as the U.K.-founded state's King Abdullah is also gravely ill. Now, many observers see the king's other brother, Prince Nayef, as a likely successor. But no matter who becomes the next crown prince, Sultan's death has triggered an unprecedented power struggle in the oil-rich Persian Gulf Kingdom. Sultan served the Saudi regime for almost seven decades, making him one of the longest-serving government officials in the world. He served as the governor of Riyadh in the 40s. In the early 50s, he then became minister of agriculture before taking up the post of defense minister in 1962, a position he held for nearly half a century. Prince Sultan's influential son, Bandar, is a former Saudi ambassador to Washington with close ties with the neocons. The deceased Sultan's brother, Prince Nayef, has also served the Saudi clan for quite a long time now. He is currently the interior minister, and his son Mohammed is his deputy. And the wheelchair-bound King Abdullah is now suffering from multiple diseases. He has undergone three surgeries within the past year. The king recently appointed his son, Prince Mutayib, as the head of the National Guard, a key security post in the police state. As his health worsened back in 2007, the Saudi king established an allegiance council to make decisions on succession issues. Many experts say the creation of this council could seriously damage Prince Nayef's chances of succession. They believe the council could choose someone else, as the rifts among the ranks of royalty continue to grow. On the other hand, the death of Sultan came at the Hajj pilgrimage season and at a time of growing uncertainty along the Saudi borders. Many observers say pilgrims from Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, and particularly Bahrain, could voice their anger at the Saudi regime's political and military interferences in their country's affairs. All this comes as Riyadh is facing an unprecedented wave of popular protests against the crackdown on dissent and lack of democracy. Women are demanding their rights, and the educated youth are questioning the very pillars of the hereditary monarchy. Well, let's find out if this is indeed true in terms of the power vacuum slash power struggle that may come about. Let me introduce our guest, Ali Latif, who's a Middle East analyst, joins us from London. We have Ali Al Ahmad, director of IGA, who joins us from Washington, and Mohsen Saleh, professor at Lebanese University, who joins us from Beirut. Gentlemen, welcome. Ali Al Ahmad, first to you. Almost as soon as uh, the news broke out about the death of the Saudi Crown Prince, it was followed by whether there's going to be a power struggle or a power vacuum within Saudi Arabia. What do you think? Well, it is created, it has created a power vacuum, and it is creating a power struggle. Uh, this is very typical. Uh, however, because Sultan occupied a large space uh, in terms of political influence, and uh, him being the crown prince and the defense minister for a long time with authority, you know, massive authorities over the, the, the government. He is probably has the, the more titles uh, as a, a Saudi official than any, anyone else. So he, his, his absence uh, is definitely is creating that uh, uh, sound as if, uh, you know, it's an, a collapse uh, and it's sucking away. He, he, you know, so that vacuum has to be filled. I think few people, his sons, and uh, some of his brothers are trying to fill that vacuum, uh, and they will have to divide uh, such uh, a space that he uh, used to occupy, uh, and this will create the, the struggles and competition in the in the, in the wrong family. I think, however, at this time, because of the Arab revolutions, they might the the the. the Uh, degree of competition and struggle will be less than uh, at other times because uh, they are somewhat united in in 
in, in, in the fact by the fears that they might face the Qaddafi uh, end or Hosni Mubarak. So you are going to see, I think, much more united front in terms of the family and their struggle to occupy uh, political power. Well, Ali Latif, I'd like to uh, uh, clarify and, and bring about the uh, people who are in line. Perhaps you can shed light on this. I mean, Saudi Arabia, as you're well aware, has been ruled since 1953 by the sons of its founder, King Abdulaziz, who had over 40 sons by multiple wives. Then you had the Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz, who had 32 children from multiple wives. Surely there are going to be some problems here. I mean, how is it that it gets decided? Is there a process involved? And who makes the claim? Because many are actually questioning that. Of course, um, I think it's it's the thing with the Saudi succession is it's been always been in a sort of opaque system. You can't really tell what or what criteria um, people use and how the family gets together to choose the next successor. What I can say is it's been a stable succession ever since, ni- uh, since 1953. And I think it's going to continue this way. I mean, people talk about power struggle, but I think the next one or two monarchs are going to be uh, chosen in the same sort of way. And it's going to be quite a stable transition, regardless of what, you know, what power struggles may exist. I think the power struggle will probably occur in a few, it, when it tries to shift to the new generation. I think that's where each of these older generation have dozens and dozens of sons and so this just opens up a whole big pool of potential uh, <coughs> potential recruits for the sort of uh, the, the monarchy and I think that's where the power struggle will occur not before that so I think the next you know Prince Naif is the front runner and I can't see anyone betting against him at the moment and the next one after him will come from the same generation so I don't think there will be a power struggle for the next you know couple of years at least. Well, Hassan Salah, let's talk about the next generation and then make a comparison analysis to the age of the ones who are right now in line. I mean, if we want to look at the statistics of the country's 24 million people, 43% are around 25 years old. So the next generation is there, it's here. And of course, given the political landscape of the region, tell us uh, what this would mean in a country where we know all the variety of restrictions that exist. Well, of course, Saudi Arabia as a monarchy is an aging uh, royal family uh, which uh, lives under uh, many problems, regional problems and internal problems. But I guess uh, concentrating on uh, Sultan's death is not very important because he has been in absentia for about at least a decade uh, and uh, probably Bandar and Naif and uh, Mutab are taking the place of, uh, of Sultan. The problem is not here. The problem is that the weaker the United States is in the region, the weaker the Saudi Arabia will, uh, will become. So that's why we will see this, as you have mentioned, power struggle in terms of the relationship between the, the Americans and uh, the Saudi branches, let's to say. So that's what we will expect some problems between these, uh, uh, these brothers, Asian brothers. Even the, the, the grandson of Abdul Aziz Bandar is an Asian person who is at least uh, uh, 75 or 70 uh, or more. So we will have to see that uh, a lot of problems will, uh, will occur inside the, uh, the, uh, the monarchy and around the monarchy uh, since it's been responding very negatively to the issues in, uh, in the region, for example, uh, uh, in Yemen, in Bahrain, in, uh, uh, in also issues uh, belonging to the Persian Gulf security, the relationship with Iran, because the, the, the Americans are guiding or misguiding the Saudis towards uh, problems they cannot tolerate. Since this is a fragile state, uh, uh, they don't have uh, constitution, they don't have liberties, they don't have election, they are uh, lacking any kind of uh, a modern state. 
That's why they have problems, inside problems, outside problems, regional problems, and I guess they will have to face a lot of uh, fatigue um, uh, issues uh, in front of them in their road to choose whether the succession, because Abdullah is also going to die soon, probably he is uh, having a lot of uh, health problems, uh, and uh, as well as Bandar, and most of them are sick persons, uh, well, I would say, yes, really sick persons, and I would say also they have to face these, uh, these very difficult issues which, uh, which uh, uh, they are not familiar with. Well, let's talk about uh, the Interior Minister, Prince Nayef Ali Al-Ahmad, uh, in terms of him being a possible uh, uh, successor. I mean, doesn't his appointment, were he to become uh, appointed, be a disappointment for the average liberal Saudis? Not to mention, of course, uh, what occurred in the recent protests. I mean, after all, he was accused of ordering police chiefs to shoot and kill unarmed demonstrators. And, of course, not to mention a laundry list of other acts like detentions, torture, human rights, etc. Yeah, Prince Naif has been always known to be the hardliner, the person who stood and is standing in the way of... Uh, uh, reforms and uh, he is responsible for the majority of human rights abuses in the country but that was his role as a minister of the interior I think now and that has been typical of the Saudi uh, monarchy if they change position they change their image as well so now you will see western media and uh, Saudi media giving him the title of a reformer and that he is a uh, modern he is uh, easy to talk to and then they will change that position, just like they did with the, uh, Abdullah when he was, before he became king, you know, before he even became pr uh, crown prince. He was uh, considered to be uh, a hardliner, but as a king, he's now a reformer. And, and Naif will play that role. I think he will, he will want to be considered as a reformer because that's how the Saudi monarchy has sold every king uh, in the past 50 years or so. So uh, he, he is a hardliner. I think a lot of people in the country are worried that uh, the, the crackdown on the population will increase because of him. His son, uh, Muhammad, is running the affairs of the interior ministry, and he has taken on his father's uh, personality. Uh, so I anticipate uh, two things, that because of King Abdullah's age and health, Naif will become the real king, and he is now basically the, the actual king in the country. Uh, and the uh, crackdown, human rights abuses, will increase tremendously. This is, however, will be also met with uh, uh, voices from the people. That you will see much more movement within the population to uh, for democracy, for human rights, and this will increase and speed up political change in Saudi Arabia. So Naif becoming king or crown prince might actually help the people, uh, uh, despite the fact that he is a dictator, that will uh, speed up the process of political change toward democracy and greater uh, human rights. Well, you know, you touched on something that I'd like to get your idea on, Ali Latif, and that is uh, maybe people within Saudi Arabia are going to see an opportunity to voice uh, some of the demands that they have, which has been obviously somewhat silenced based on the restrictions. And we saw what happened in uh, uh, the province of Qatif, where they voiced their solidarity with uh, uh, their uh, people in Bahrain. And of course, uh, I'm sure you're well aware that uh, uh, Naif is the one that was involved in the kingdom's decision to send military forces into neighboring Bahrain. But aside from that, uh, do you think that uh, that's based on Ali al-Ahmad, he's going to actually be a little bit more softer and be pro-reform, uh, but uh, that people are going to rise up more in order to uh, get some of their demands heard? Or how do you see that scenario playing out where it to happen? <coughs> I, think I think it would be easier. Uh, this will be for Ali uh, Alati. I'll get back to you, I, Ali Alati. I would Ahmad. agree. Sorry. Uh, um, what I would agree is um, there's, yeah, there is a bit of a false distinction between the fact that, you know, King Abdullah and Prince Naif, one's a reformer, one's a hardliner. I don't think there is that distinction in the ruling family. They do not tolerate dissent, regardless of who it is. 
and they again play it quite cleverly. I mean, for example, it's no coincidence that um, all the monarchies in the Middle East survived so far the sort of Arab Spring, what you may call the turmoil going on at the moment, um, because they know that they can draw on some other channels of patronage. They are the rulers of Saudi Arabia, they are the guardians of you know, Mecca and Medina, the holy sites of Islam, and therefore they, add, they, they, they have this extra pull, extra sort of shield that uh, I think it insulates them from a lot of the dissent that should actually be occurring in Saudi Arabia. They, are, you know, they, they, they operate a monarchy, they, they, they did not tolerate dissent, there is no sort of actual state institutions as uh, the previous uh, a commentator was saying it's 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 something that I don't think is going to change, and people might try to take the opportunity during this transition to in uh, of power, but I do not think it's going to make a difference. They're going to uh, not tolerate dissent in the same way. They're going to crack down on protests, but they're also going to give a few carrots out, you know, pro, uh, invest a bit more into the country, and I think things are going to carry on unless you know unless. The U.S., as I said, if the U.S. support declines, which again, I don't think it will because it's such a strategic ally of the U.S. in the region. I think it's, they're going to keep supporting this Saudi Arabia and supporting a stable system that they do have at the moment. So I don't see any, okay. any sort of chance of unrest. In well, let's future. find out what Mohsen Saleh thinks. Mohsen Saleh, what do you think? An opportunity for the average Saudi, liberal Saudis to use this opportunity uh, were it to come up, to rise up? Well, uh, of course, the Saudis... Uh, the people in Al Qatif or other places, the women especially, the, some non-governmental organizations will have to move because at least some promises from even the king, Abdullah, uh, that he will give the right to women to uh, choose and to elect in four years. But I guess that will happen before that. Because Naif will, uh, I guess, as a successor of uh, uh, of Sultan. Uh, he is, I guess, in my opinion, he is neither a modernist nor a, a, a reformer. So, uh, well, uh, I guess uh, clashes will take place, will occur on the ground of the, the, the existence of the Saudis in Bahrain and also the, the troubles in Al Qatif, which the Saudis, they used uh, guns, they used, uh, they attacked, they imprisoned people, they deprived them from their basic rights. And even not in Al Qatif, in other places in Al Rayyad, there were demonstrations asking for their uh, basic rights, uh, human rights, to talk, even to, uh, to elect, to, their, uh, to choose their representatives, uh, uh, to choose uh, uh, a new uh, parliament, or to do any uh, reforms. The Americans cannot say no for these questions. So that's why the Saudis, either they have to reform or they have to face problems. Whether Naif, the uh, backward peep, uh, uh, person or who, who really financed Al-Qaeda and financed the Wahhabis, whether in Iraq or he, he was the one behind the uh, uh, the Saudis entrance to, uh, to Al Bahrain and also other places and the relationship, the close ties with the United States. That's why I guess the political system, the political mind of the Saudi, uh, Saudis is not functioning very well according to the issues in the region. The region is changing and they are stagnant. That's why mm -hmm. they have to face problems. And uh, that's why uh, Naif and Abdullah and others, uh, of course, Bandar, one of them, the, the new Khan, the real new Khan in the Saudi family. And they have, I guess, to reconsider their existence as a royal family uh, trying to block any kind of reformation in this region. Ali Al Ahmad, do you go along with uh, what Mohsen Saleh said there? in terms of uh, the fact that the political landscape is changing and uh, Saudi Arabia needs to somewhat conform itself to it. I mean, is that how it goes? And of course, uh, uh, how uh, the relationship of the United States with Saudi Arabia would affect any foreign policy uh, changes were they uh, to happen? This, this, the U.S. policy toward Saudi Arabia is very stable. It is to support and uh, the ruling family and to guarantee their security. And that has not changed in 50 years. Uh, yes, there are regional changes and the Saudi monarchy will have to make some adjustments, but because they are consumed by maintaining their power 
and uh, uh, maintaining the struggle with, between them to a minimum, they will not change very much. Uh, it will be easier, however, for the people. <clears throat> I wanted to make this distinction that in the outside world, in the United States, uh, knife will be uh, sold and uh, uh, promoted as a reformer, as a visionary, just like they did with King Abdullah and King Fahd and King Saud before them. Uh, however, inside the country, that uh, image, that reality cannot be changed because Naif is, uh, uh, had touched basically every part of the country with his uh, abuse. He is responsible for massive amount of human rights abuses against basically every segment of the society. So people have not forgotten that and they realize that he is a man who will never change. He, that's the, the nature of the guy. He's a hardliner, he is uh, an abuser of human rights, and that's why it would be easier for the people in the country to stand up against the, uh, and he's not going to be able to trick them or deceive them, just like King Abdullah did with his uh, charming words and promises. Uh, the reality is that Naif is probably incapable unca- 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 of, of doing or taking the place of Abdullah in this, in this issue. Uh, that's why it will be easier for activists and human rights leaders to stand up against him. And we know that the uh, the movement, uh, the uh, the movement, uh, the Arabia movement for uh, uh, political and civil rights has filed uh, a case uh, against him, against Naif, because of his uh, uh, abuses of the prisoners and responsibility of murder and other uh, abuses. So people in the country. Do not, I have, you know, it's very rarely to see people who uh, give Naif any credit except the religious extremists whom he supports. So okay. it would be good for the country, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ali Al Ahmad. He's director of IGA with the State Minister from Washington. Mosin Saleh, thank you. Professor of Lebanese University from Beirut. And uh, Ali Latif, Middle East analyst, gave us his statements from London. And thank you, the viewer, for watching another edition of Press TV News Analysis. Any questions, comments, suggestions, do send them. Old-fashioned way. Newsroom at PressTV.ir. From Ikaba Tahwe and the entire team, it's goodbye.